then I'll switch to the screen. Mm -hmm. How do you... Yeah, can you raise the screen <coughs> for now? Then at some point uh, I need to back. At the moment yeah. you mm -hmm. pull up the screen. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I may say I was told by Italian once that gentlemen never apologize. Okay. Just go on. I told my gentlemen. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, I should tell you that uh, uh, we have had here phenomena which in the United States. We had the resignation of the computer expert of the place, and the res after it, also the projector resigned. So mm -hmm. the, the, the people here are not totally familiar with everything we go to. Please stay away. <coughs> okay, good morning, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to be a speaker. I didn't realize that I would be the first lecturer, which puts additional uh, honor on my shoulders, the burden of honor. Okay, so, uh, so Eliezer already told you uh, roughly what I'll be talking about, and uh, I should say that I have fond memories. I was once a lecturer here before, which was, I think, exactly 13 years ago. The school started in 2005 and ended in 2006, and uh, I talked uh, about related subjects, uh, gauge gravity duality, but the spirit of the talks w w were quite different. I think those models pretty much emphasized supersymmetric theories, and now 13 years later we still haven't found supersymmetry, uh, and some of the large N techniques actually are quite applicable to non-supersymmetric theories. So. This time I will mostly talk about non-supersymmetric large N expansions. And uh, I think uh, the, the really new stuff is uh, uh, what I learned over the last two years, which is uh, these so-called tensor models. But uh, tensor models are a bit exotic and, and special. And I wanted to give first lecture on older stuff, just to motivate why large N expansions are important in theoretical physics. So, so basically the title of the first lecture is uh, in praise of large N. In praise of large N. Okay, so what is, uh, what is large N? Uh, basically, it's a very theorist kind of topic to work on. Like you, it's basically a set of tricks when you don't have other tricks at your disposal. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes in physics, it, uh, you, you have a small n system which is very hard to solve. For example, SU3 gauge theory, namely quantum chromodynamics which was invented by the director of the school. Unfortunately, he's not here yet. Uh, and then just a year, uh, people pretty quickly realized that QCD is going to be hard to solve. And just one year later, Hoft came up with the idea of large N expansion and planar diagrams for, uh, for QCD. Uh, but actually, large N, as Eliezer alluded to, uh, goes back uh, to the 60s at least, or even earlier. Uh, and, uh, and I will talk about basically three generic classes of, of large N limits. So, so three, three generic, generic large N limits. 
Okay, the first one you can roughly characterize as the vector uh, large n limit. Uh, so I will denote the number of degrees of freedom, number of degrees of freedom as curly n, just to distinguish it from this uh, usual n. And uh, so the first one is where the number of degrees of freedom scales linearly with n. And this is uh, basically the vector models. Vector models. Uh, and uh, so they apply, for example, to ON magnets, uh, magnets and such, uh, and uh, various phase transitions in, uh, in these situations. And I think one of the, uh, this certainly goes back at least to the 60s. For example, Stanley wrote a paper with a solution, Stanley in like 1968, wrote a paper with a solution of the ON a magnet model, and I'll talk a, b a bit about it uh, in a second. Uh, then, then, of course, the, there are these so-called uh, Wilson-Fisher theories, so three-dimensional. Uh, so here, uh, one thing that comes to mind and has been a topic of recent research is 3D CFTs, which often come with this vectorial type of matter. Basically, you have a uh, matter, which is a vector transforming in the fundamental of, uh, of group ON or UN, and you have a lot of interesting stuff going on. These theories are generically solvable. Uh, namely, you can develop large N expansions, uh, and I'll uh, basically in any dimension. They're not dependent on some specific feature of the theory or specific dimension. So, so they tend to be generally solvable. Okay, so then, then number two is what I already mentioned, which is the, uh, the case where the number of degrees of freedom goes like n squared. And this is the, uh, the Toft expansion. I should say that part of the reason why they're solvable is that everything is dominated by, by dub bubble diagrams. Dominated by bubble diagrams. Okay, and I'll explain in a second what this means. Uh, where sometimes they're called snail diagrams, but um, okay, so. This Toft expansion uh, here, uh, you have you have some matrix, uh, for example, phi i j in the joint representation, and uh, what Toft introduced is a kind of stranded notation. So if you have a, a propagator for this field, you can represent it by the uh, the double line notation, where one of the indices goes in one direction and the other one goes in the other direction. And, uh, and this is a very important thing because, for example, it uh, applies to QCD. And here the leading diagrams are planar diagrams. Planar diagrams. Uh, which, which appear in the leading order. Uh, so if you have the, some path integral uh, Z, uh, and log z gives you the sum of the connected diagrams. Uh, sum <coughs> so f. Then you find that uh, the leading term in f goes like n squared, and this term is given by by these planar diagrams. Okay, so many of you probably know this, and I should say that I recently. Uh, 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 collaborated on a set of lecture notes, which I think all of you uh, were given a link to. It's also my very most recent paper on on the archive, uh, and uh, so you can consult. Like a lot of what I say is in those lecture notes, so it makes it easier for you to follow. Okay, so this is the the Toft expansion, and this uh, this started in 1974. 
right, and is continuing to this day. And one of the reasons why it's turned out to be so important is that uh, string theory has a natural place in this uh, uh, basically Toft large n limit. Uh, and then the newest stuff, which has been going on only for several uh, uh, several years, is the the tensor large n limit, where you have uh, the number of degrees of freedom scaling as n to the r. And here it's very important to take r at least three. Like this, this new limit is uh, not possible for matrices. It's inherently relying on at least rank three tensors and beyond. And uh, so this is the tensor, tensor large n limit. Okay, and, uh, and in this case, um, it's somehow by definition a bit more exotic than these other ones. Uh, so here, not only do you uh, have this higher higher number of degrees of freedom scaling at least as n cubed, but you also must include specially chosen interactions. So you have to have special choice of uh, choice of tensor interactions. Uh, so in particular. So here, the analog of, of, uh, of this uh, stranded notation will be the tricolored graphs. So for example, if you have a, uh, like a tensor degree of freedom phi ABC, and the unstranded propagator is just a single line, uh, I guess we don't have colored chalk, but hopefully I'll have for next time. But you basically resolve each one into the flow lines for three uh, Yeah, you can represent, for example, the flow of the index A by the solid line, the flow in the index B of by dashed line, and index C by dotted line. So, uh, so we will be drawing, but they look nicer if each one is colored, and I'll show some pictures of, of these colored interactions. And it turns out that now there are, so for example, one very simple set of models that you can write down are models with ON, uh, on cube symmetry where each of these indices transforms under a separate on group okay and uh, and then there there will be like a growing set of choices of how you write interaction terms so even for the quartic term there are different choices you have some of this choice already for for the matrix model, and it's the single trace versus double trace notation. So for example, here, already on the level of uh, matrix model, you can either have the single trace interaction, single trace, like when the interaction is just trace, say, phi to the four, right? Or you can have double trace. Double trace where you say V, say it's V G1, and this is G2 is trace phi squared squared. Uh, this is what happens in the simplest uh, matrix model. In QCD, of course, you uh, this type of thing would not be gauge invariant. So what Hoft was doing was safe for from double trace issues, at least when in the QCD Lagrangian, but you do have to face it a little bit. And, and to achieve a good large end limit <coughs> for, the, for the case of uh, matrix models, you basically need to scale the double trace interaction differently in the large end limit from the single trace interaction. And this uh, subtlety comes to hit you really hard in the case of these tensor models. So one needs to be much more careful into which interactions you pick and how you scale them, which ones are dominant in the large end limit and which ones are subdominant and things like that. Uh, okay, so so this is uh, so now these models were explored uh, 
I think starting around 2009 by uh, Gurao, Rivaso, and collaborators, uh, with the aim of uh, of generalizing some successes that happened with matrix models. Basically, these planar diagrams uh, for matrix models could be thought of as string world sheets or could be thought of as just uh, two-dimensional geometry. And we'll see that the natural generalization, for example, for rank three tensors will be, instead of gluing together triangles, we will be gluing tetrahedra together, triangles or squares. Right, so, so we will have tetrahedra appearing in this case, and uh, their hope was, uh, yeah, it's all right, it's all right. Yeah. Uh, so gluing tetrahedra, so the initial application was to 3D quantum gravity or higher D quantum gravity. But I think this uh, pretty quickly ran into some problems in the sense that the geometries that were dominant were only very degenerate geometries. And it doesn't seem like so far there has been much success in understanding 3D quantum gravity. Uh, and they were primarily uh, doing this model in just zero dimension, namely you, you simply took some integral over tensors phi A, B, C. Uh, but then, uh, then a big uh, new direction that came right around two years ago was uh, uh, tensor quantum mechanics. Tensor quantum mechanics, namely the D equal one theory, and especially for fermionic degrees of freedom, for Majorana fermion. Fermions and connection with SYK. Connection with SYK model. And there was a very interesting paper defining the first tensor quantum mechanical model by Witten that came uh, about two years and two months ago. Uh, and this opened, uh, basically he pointed out that, uh, so what was already known before then is that uh, if, you, if you take a special choice of tensor interactions, then you're naturally led to a subclass of Feynman diagrams which are uh, richer than bubbles but poorer than, than the planar graphs. So it's a certain different subset of planar graphs called, uh, uh, people often call them melonic diagrams. Melonic diagrams. And, uh, <coughs> and then if you actually look carefully at what happens in the SYK model, there you also have melonic diagrams. So, so in fact, the diagrammatics of the leading large N tensor model is uh, basically the same as that of the SYK model. But uh, this is achieved in the tensor model without any built-in disorder. They're just standard quantum mechanical systems without any disordered interactions. So the logic is very, very similar to the logic of these first two limits. So my main goal in these lectures is basically to explain the, how, this how these melonic diagrams follow if you take special interactions and then discuss some applications, uh, they do have some interesting physics in them already on, on the quantum mechanical level and, uh, and beyond. So, so that's, that's basically uh, my rough plan of lectures. Uh, and I wanted to now just talk a little bit about the classic stuff uh, about ON uh, symmetric magnets and just uh, remind you how, how the picture of 1 over n expansion works in those cases, but are there any questions at this point? Yes? Yeah, connection. Connection with SV. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are also corrections in the sense that what happens is that while the leading uh, large n limit for SYK and tensor model is basically the same, the 1 over n effects are very different in, in the tensor. Even the powers of n that are associated uh, 
are, are very different. Yeah. Oh, this this one. This one is not movable, but but I'll s I'll keep saying this many times. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, uh, I'll have uh, many slides on this, so so it, it will, it should become clearer. Okay, so the basic uh, let me just start a bit with the vector models. Okay, uh, I need to. And I want to, just in case you don't care about tensor models, at least I want to impress that uh, large N is actually useful just as a tool for quantum field theory, for example, in three dimensions. So, so for example, suppose you take a bunch of lattice sites. I won't draw them in three dimensions because my artistic skills, especially given jet lag, are not very good. Uh, but you, you take some set of spins, spin vectors, at each lattice site, right? Uh, uh, so you have this ON, ON magnet, right? It's uh, the energy functional E is written as uh, minus J times sum over nearest neighbors IJ and I dot NJ. Okay, where n is an n component vector. Right? n is uh, n1, n2, and n, and it's a unit vector, right? So, so n squared is equal to 1, right? Uh, and then the idea is to take the, the partition function, right, which is sum over absolutely all configurations of these vectors. Right, uh, e to the minus beta times this energy functional. Right, so these are actually this is physical. For example, so for n equal one, uh, n equal one, this gives the the case of the easing model. Right, n equal two is the x y model. Right, and these models definitely apply to nature, then n equal 3 is the Heisenberg. So you can also think of them as some kind of mo uh, molecules with spins interacting. Uh, so lots of uh, condensed matter applications to these three. Then starting n equal 4 and higher, you don't see too much stuff in the textbooks. And uh, it turns out that there are some lattice effects that make some kind of cubic anisotropy effects of the lattice that make n equal four and higher models less stable than these three cases. But but still you can study them, for example, simulate them on, on the lattice in a more pure way. And recently these uh, these models have been studied a lot using conformal bootstrap and uh, so the conformal bootstrap is a new tool to study these models. So, in particular, why, why, why do we say conformal bootstrap? Is because, uh, because we want to tune the system to a second order phase transition. Right? And, uh, so what happens when we tune, uh, tune beta to beta C, right? Where, where spins start having, uh, where continuous phase transition occurs. Phase transition occurs. And, and then the correlation functions between these spins uh, become long range, right? So you basically want to look at the correlation functions of say an i of x with nj of zero, right? You expect this by on symmetry to be delta ij divided by one over 
x to the 2 delta, where delta is the scaled, scaling dimension of the basic field. And then usually you have also some, some notion of finite correlation length. And this correlation length diverges as a beta approaches beta c. So as beta approaches beta c, you this, uh, this correlation length diverges. And now we, we can have a, uh, so this is the famous second order phase transition, which was, I think, f first made its appearance theoretically in, uh, in the paper by Landau in 1936. Uh, and uh, a lot of what, uh, what people have been doing was a series of steps following this, this amazing idea. Uh, so, so how do we uh, attempt a field theoretic description of, of this uh, second order phase transition? For example, it happens for all models in D equals 3. So in D equals 3, uh, the, the case N equal 1 describes actually the water vapor critical point and various other inert gases. So n equal 1 is a kind of mother of all three-dimensional second-order phase transitions. So this is really physical. Describes water vapor, vapor critical point. Namely, if you look at the phase diagram for water and vapor, right, you, you see some, some kind of structure like this. And this critical point exists at high temperature and pressure. And here, essentially, water and vapor become indistinguishable. And there is restoration of symmetry between water and vapor if you go. So you can go around this critical point. <coughs> so <coughs> and then similar things can happen in for higher end, in, uh, especially in three dimensions. Uh, in two dimensions, there is some quantum abstraction once you go to n beyond 2 then there you pick up some beta function and RG flow. But in three dimensions, absolutely all of these magnet models lead to second order phase transitions. So how do we write a, a field theoretic model? Well, we essentially introduced an average uh, spin. Like, uh, because correlation length is large, you can average over many lattice spacings. And, uh, and you can write the following Euclidean three-dimensional field theory. So you, so you, uh, can you, you can't see this. Uh, so I'll, let me just write, uh, and try to write it more. So Euclidean, Euclidean on symmetric CFT, uh, symmetric QFT just looks like this, right? The Euclidean action is integral d3x times 1 half d mu phi i squared. Then uh, there is plus m squared over 2 phi i phi i, right? And plus g over 4 phi i phi i squared. Okay, so when, uh, when you study this thing classically, you see that for m squared bigger than zero, the symmetry is unbroken, and for m squared less than zero, the symmetry is broken. So, so at the phase transition, uh, at the second order phase transition, you tune this m squared is basically being tuned to zero, right? So you make a transition between this type of picture and this type of picture, right? Where this is like a figure of revolution, right? Uh, right so this is the, the unbroken, and this is broken. And the second order phase transition sits right at the boundary between these two phases. So now we have to devise some kind of techniques for studying this. and you quickly realize that this, this is a rather strongly coupled problem. Because 
Suppose you forget about this term here, start with a massless field. Uh, you see that the UV, uh, so there is some kind of RG flow from, so in the UV, UV you have G equals zero, and just the free theory of a massless, of n massless fields. So free, free QFT of n massless fields. Right, and in the infrared, formally G basically go goes to infinity because, uh, because this, this operator is relevant, right? So in the UV, the scaling dimension of phi, uh, delta phi, is equal to one half. So this perturbing operator has dimension delta phi to the four is equal to two. And the fact that this is smaller than three means that uh, the G becomes basically is a relevant coupling. So, so this is a so-called relevant operator. So the, as you flow from the UV to IR, the effects of this interaction become large, right? So you, you have to deal with large effects of, of this interaction. So, and this, uh, this clearly poses a, a sort of non-perturbative problem for how, to, how you address the computation of scaling exponents. And this is exactly the type of problem where large n can be useful, right? So, you should say that because mm. you emphasize that mm. in all dimensions, the gra graphical expansion is the same. Uh, right, physics, right. But the physics. Yeah, the I'm just talking. Yeah, I'm giving a kind of yeah. Uh, so this this picture actually, yeah, I should say that. Uh, <coughs> so one one of the approaches. Yeah, certainly physics very much is dimension dependent. Uh, and in particular, the second, uh, like for, for this famous uh, window between uh, two and four dimensions, there is a kind of dynamical phase transition that happens. And so one technique for studying what happens is the, uh, so in, in D equal to four minus epsilon, you still have, uh, that the IR fixed point is weakly coupled. Is weakly coupled. And, uh, and this produces the so-called uh, epsilon expansion. This gives us an idea of uh, epsilon expansion. But this, this requires this funny business of dimensional continuation, right? Which sometimes is a bit confusing. Like precisely what, what do you mean when you f work in fractional dimensions? And recently there have been additional questions about, about how to deal with that. <coughs> uh, let's see, does, are people fairly familiar with how this works? I should probably say at least a few words about, uh, for example, this is sufficiently textbook material that you can see it in Paskin and Schroeder. But, but essentially the reason, the way you, you deal with this uh, four minus epsilon expansion is you notice that the beta function of the theory, so for example, in D equal four, this is just the standard five four theory with the logarithmic flow and marginal interaction. So, so you know that the beta function, beta g, right, which is d, d so in d equal uh, dg by d log m, right, a standard computation gives n plus 8 divided by 8 pi squared times g squared, okay? And, uh, and the theory, therefore, where this is the RG scale, right? So as a result of it, uh, so if you plot this beta function, you basically see that, uh, that it looks like this. 
And that means that in the long distance limit, the coupling just flows to zero, and the theory becomes very weakly interacting. Okay, and th this actually means that there is no critical behavior exactly in four dimensions. That's the reason because of this, this simple answer. But if you go to, uh, to four minus epsilon dimensions, then there is a leading term, which is minus epsilon g, which just comes from the scaling dimension of, of the field. So the picture starts looking like this. And you have this, so the theory basically, when it flows from the UV to IR, it stabilizes at this weakly coupled fixed point. And this is G star, G star. So you see that this G star is of order, it's 8 pi squared divided by n plus 8 times epsilon plus some order epsilon squared correction. And this you basically can see in various textbooks, right? And then, uh, then when you compute, so how do you then compute the, the scaling dimensions uh, in 4 minus epsilon dimension? Well, you have to plug in, uh, plug in the, this G star into the anomalous dimension, and you find the following formula. For example, in slightly below four dimensions, you find the delta phi i, uh, which is uh, d over 2 minus 1 plus gamma. This is the anomalous dimension, and this is just the bare dimension, right, of a scalar field. Everyone, yeah, this is just the dimension of a free scalar field in, in spatial dimension D, and this is the anomalous dimension. This you get to be 1 minus epsilon over 2 plus some correction like n plus 2 over 4 n plus 8 squared times epsilon squared plus uh, corrections, and then delta of the phi squared operator is 2 minus 6 over n plus 8 times epsilon. Yeah, one thing that I wanted to stress is that already here you see some feature of this vectorial large n limit, namely that, that g star is of order 1 over n. So in all these, this is, I'm just doing some particular kind of theory, but in vectorial limit, uh, you always keep g uh, to be of order 1 over n. And this is dynamically happens here. Unless you do that, the diagrams will just explode and you will not have a controlled limit. So all these standard large n limits are achieved when you as you increase the number of degrees of freedom, you simultaneously scale the interaction strength to <coughs> infinity as some power of 1 over n. Okay, so, <coughs> so this was uh, first, uh, first done in a paper by Wilson and Fisher in 1972 uh, and provided a lot of technology for how to compute things in d equals 3, for example, it's another theorist trick, which is a bit hokey, kind of. It's, uh, you just develop some series. This series is divergent. It's an asymptotic series, but then you have to resum it and extrapolate. And it basically gives pretty good, uh, good results in D equals 3, but it's a bit model dependent. But, but this is sort of one approach to, to this theory. But there is a, a completely different approach where where instead of working in D slightly below 4, you work at arbitrary D, but at large n. Okay, and they want to essentially explain how that works. Okay, so, so how do you uh, try to develop the, the large n expansion sort of from the beginning? So this is what's called the Wilson-Fisher epsilon expansion and is widely used, but then uh, the, the direct 1 over n expansion 
So one over n expansion in continuous D. It's another formal trick where you introduce the so-called hubbard stratonovich field. So you rewrite this action with the help of an additional parameter, which is, doesn't have a kinetic term from the beginning, but, uh, but you essentially rewrite the action S as uh, integral d dx times one half d mu phi i squared plus sigma over two phi i squared and then you add like plus one over four g sigma squared and this is called the uh, auxiliary field or so this is uh, so-called hubbard stratonovich or auxiliary field so then you basically uh, it's clear that if you just integrate over sigma along some appropriate contour, or just solve the classical equation of motion, uh, you get the constraint that sigma, sigma by the classical equation of motion is, uh, is equal to g times phi i squared, right? And then you eliminate it, you get the term phi, phi squared squared, okay? One thing that I also should stress is that the only quartic interaction term in the vector models that you can have is double trace, right? This is what you would call a double trace term. You cannot write a single trace term for So this is the only possibility which is a kind of double trace. Yeah, it's basically a square, uh, it's a square of an invariant term, right? Uh, so phi i, phi i is obviously an on invariant, right? And it's a product of two of these things. You cannot write a thing which is fully connected, right? Like for matrices, you can. For matrices, you can just write trace phi, 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 phi. Uh, or you can write trace phi phi times trace phi phi. Here, this is the only thing you can write, and it's a product of two, two invariant things. And this is the reason why we can rewrite it as, um, this is the reason why we can introduce this hubbard stratonovich field, right? Because uh, if it weren't the case, you wouldn't be able to introduce just a one-component field like this, right? Because sigma has no indices, it's just uh, one degree of freedom, and it's by the equation of motion equal to this, then you, you get back this, this term. Yeah, yeah, I formally dialed the mass term to, to zero, right? Yeah, maybe I meant minus here. Okay, so, but then here comes the crucial thing, which allows you to solve these models, is that Although there is no, no kinetic term in the classical action, you have the induced, uh, induced dynamics for sigma. So you, can, you have the induced, induced dynamics, dynamics for, for sigma, which comes from the loop of the phi field. Namely, if you want to look at what this, uh, the, the two-point function of sigma is, you have to evaluate the loop of the phi field like this. And this loop is uh, inherently going to be non-local. So you will, you will have some kind of, uh, so, so in the infrared, you will have basically the two-point function of sigma of p with sigma of minus p which will scale as absolute value p to some power uh, alpha, okay? And uh, we'll compute this alpha in a second, but then you see that the way you obtain the sort of infrared dynamics is by noting that if alpha is equal to zero, uh, so if alpha is less, 
than zero, then at low momenta, this term is dominant compared to this term, right? It basically blows up at small p while this term just stays constant. So you can just completely forget about this term in the infrared. So can ignore, can ignore this term far in the infrared, namely at low, low momenta. And moreover, because there are n fields here, you will have a factor of n. So you get some kind of non-local propagator for this sigma of p, uh, uh, which is just the inverse of this. Uh, so the propagator will be the in. Yeah, I think. Yeah, this is the. We should just call this sigma of p. Sigma of p. Yes. Oh, uh, well, you can just do it, and you see that the power you get, first of all, this power uh, continuously depends on dimension, right? Like, it's only local if it's just p squared, for example. Like, yeah, if you added just d sigma squared term, this, this would be p squared or p squared log p. Uh, but, but here you have just something that... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll actually show some slides about this in a second. But yeah, so so it, it's not local, but it works, and you get uh, uh, you get a systematic one over an expansion. Then the propagator for sigma, this propagator will be just the inverse of this, which is one over n p to the power uh, minus alpha. And the way, for example, you compute the anomalous dimension of the phi field is by dressing this phi field with the sigma diagram. And this gives you, because this is the 1 over n, this gives you a 1 over n correction to, uh, to the scaling dimension of the phi field. And then you basically iterate this procedure, and you can, it gets a little subtle, but you can work out uh, different uh, formula for dimensions of, <coughs> of these phi squared as a function of d. So for example, in, uh, from this approach, you get in d equals 3. In d equals 3, you get that delta phi i is 1 half plus 4 over 3 pi squared n plus some order 1 over n squared term. And people even went to 1 over n cubed here, which is rather complicated. And then delta of phi squared is equal to 2 minus 32 over 3 pi squared n. This order 1 over n squared. You see, the reason you can tell that this theory is not weakly interacting is because in the UV, uh, in the UV, delta phi squared was what? Just in the free theory. It's just two times one half, right? So it was one. Oh, sorry, delta phi i. Delta phi i. Or delta, yeah, I don't have to put this. Delta phi. Right, so, so if the theory were weakly interacting, then you would just get twice this dimension, but you see that you get a large order one correction. And this is sort of the, the big sign that this, uh, this series uh, is not weakly interacting. And uh, so this, this nice method is not limited to this uh, scalar theory. You can also apply it to other types of theories, like uh, in particular lately in the news have been uh, fermionic, type theories like the gross neve model and, uh, and so on. Oh, let's see, where am I? Oh, how much time do I have? Mm -hmm. Out of 90 minutes, you have used uh, 52. Oh, sorry, I still have quite a lot. OK. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. So, so one, 
so large n is a great tool, but it's not always good at small n, by definition. <laughs> uh, the hope is that it's good, but actually, if you read this historic wilson Cogat review, I don't know if anyone here never looked at it, I highly recommend it. Uh, so it, it was based on some lectures that, uh, apparently there is some history about this, and David can confirm it when he arrived, but apparently, uh, since Wilson was obviously doing interesting work around 1973, 74, uh, David invited him to Princeton and told him, I think he was visiting the institute, and he told him, you can give as many lectures as you want, just keep going as long as you want. And he went for something like 19 <laughs> lectures. And Cogat was a postdoc at Princeton at the time, and he, he was taking notes, and eventually they they wrote this historic review, so I highly recommend it. Um, On dimensions up to three, why do you discriminate against pi squared q? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a valid question. Uh, I mean, it's not the leading relevant operator, right? I mean, yeah, there are all these subtleties, but, but this certainly correctly describes what goes on because phi squared is uh, the leading. So, so Wilson Hogart. And they have a lot of interesting comments about criticality in four dimensions. For example, one big chapter there is search for critical behavior in D equal four, which was not successful, at least not for scalar theory. But one interesting thing uh, is which I wanted to mention. At the very beginning, they say that from here we can immediately tell because you see 1 over n plus 8. You see that uh, 1 over n expansion will fail below 8 just from the, the fact that there is a pole at minus 8. And this is roughly actually was very prophetic remark was just based on this very simple estimate. So so they uh, so this one over n expansion expansion uh, good for for n greater than or equal to eight like so it's not good at all for for describing the for example three D Ising model while and this is part of the motivation for why they focused on epsilon expansion epsilon expansion actually is is very, very good. So if you look at numerically, let's see, I should find the... Okay, so... Yeah, so if you, pl if you plug in the numbers, right, like here, for example, you get that this is 1 half plus 0 0.135 over n, minus 0 0.097 over n squared. And then I think you already get something large as the next term. Uh, and for this one, you get 2 minus 1.08 divided by n <laughs> minus 3.05 over n squared. So you see that for n, you basically, the rough thing, so the thing you learn immediately is that the coefficients will grow uh, for sufficiently high order. So these are, so these one over n expansion is asymptotic, is asymptotic. But with, with these asymptotic expansions, if you still go to large enough n, it gives you a good approximation, good numerical approximation. If you take the first terms that are still decreasing, roughly speaking. Like once you start hitting increasing terms, you basically stop there. This is the rough, very rough thing. Uh, but the estimate you get from here is really very poor for the Ising model. You see that, for example, if you take this seriously, you get a correction of whether, uh, uh, I don't know, point 0.1 or something like this. But we know that uh, that in the Ising model, uh, the epsilon coefficients are much, much better behaved. 
Okay, so uh, uh, I think uh, yeah. In this case, uh, I'm not sure how to prove it. I think it always tends to be for, for example, for planar graphs. You, if you sort of estimate what is the number of diagrams that contributes to higher order in one over n, I think it, it grows faster. So, so, so typically you get factorial growth of these coefficients. For epsilon expansion, it's rather clear because it's just a loop expansion and we know that the graphs with, you know, uh, of order with g loops, their number grows like either g factorial or, or uh, Square root of g factorial. So in that, for epsilon expansion, it's also asymptotic and it's completely clear. Here, all the models they've seen that uh, they they give. Right, right. Well, I right. You can also. T uh, I'll mention a fermionic theory, but I don't think there is such luck and. Yeah, if you actually look at. Uh, uh, yeah, so so clearly this expansion is n not very good. Even though I'm praising large n, I have to admit that uh, this doesn't work so well for n smaller than a. On the other hand, the epsilon expansion works very well. So, for example, here if you look at the higher order term, so for for the uh, Ising model, you get like. Uh, So for n equal 1, you get, for example, delta phi is equal to uh, 1 minus epsilon over 2 plus epsilon squared over 108. You see this very nice uh, small number. And the next term is plus epsilon cubed times 109 over 108 squared. And then they start uh, they start growing, I think. But but if you uh, if you just truncate to these uh, three terms, uh, these these four terms, you get you get uh, delta is approximately zero point five one eight six, and the actual number, which we now know very precisely is delta phi, so actual, actual is uh, 0 0.518, So you see how well the epsilon expansion does. This is somehow very hypnotic to the earliest epsilon expansion people. And people have pushed this to higher loops. You can do some fancy extrapolation techniques taking into account the fact that the theory in d equal 2 is exactly solvable. Well, Sasha is one of the people who solved it <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, so, uh, so there you know the exact dimension of the phi field, which is 1 8, and the exact dimension of the phi squared field, uh, which is 1. Right, and um, so, th so this, this gets you even closer to this number. And then most recently, the conformal bootstrap allowed to even further improve on the precision of this. So, so, so just blindly put epsilon equals to you get the horrible answer here. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, this is, uh, yeah, for one, you get uh, a good answer. But then, yeah, often when you actually make these plots, you see that getting from four to three is not that hard. But then the curve starts becoming very uncertain. Like it starts, like the error bars dramatically increase. Uh, but then more recently, people are generally raising questions to what extent this dimensionful continuation is rigorous and so on. On the other hand, the 1 over n expansion is, uh, in some sense, it's perfectly rigorous. You can just sit directly in d equal 3, uh, do this 1 over n expansion, and just for n large enough, it's going to work. 
So I wanted to uh, just show a little bit more about this stuff and also show some plots from Bootstrap, which I think for the first time allow us <coughs> to test one over n expansion at higher values of n. So I'll open it up. And also, I w it will let me. You want the screen? Yes, 